Welcome to another video from the Garish Grackle. This video will be thinking about thinking. As you listen to this, do you find outside distractions being cleared away as increasingly you gain focus on my voice? As an individual, do you possess an immediate strategy before you watch this video to remember key concepts long after? Do you think that you will now develop a strategy to better remember key concepts of future videos that hold your interest? Are you setting yourself up for failure, telling yourself that this is too difficult? Can you work out a strategy that will reach a desired goal in seven moves? Do you problem solve by imagining or visualizing steps towards achieving a solution? I want you to then think about the concept of thinking. Thinking is a field in cognitive psychology that is the scientific inquiry and field of investigation that uncovers the mysteries that design the mind. These blueprints of the mind are built by seemingly simple yet ultimately highly complex blocks or units of thought. The ability to think, enable and empower us to access knowledge and then to reason and solve problems. Frequently, language is the medium that represents the way we think. As cognitive psychologists investigate deeper into the realm of thinking, it is revealed that daily thought is a truly complex and vast phenomenon. As the procedures that comprise thinking is for the most part not directly observable, it is then the role of cognitive psychologists to build theories detailing the mechanisms of thinking. The theories of thinking. This video will explore four individual approaches or perspectives to the study of thinking. These approaches are the psychometric approach, the Piagetian approach, the information processing approach, and the situated cognition approach. The psychometric approach. The role of the cognitive psychologist who adopts the psychometric approach is to determine people's individual mental or cognitive ability. Psychologists of the psychometric approach are tasked with the responsibility of then measuring mental capacity. The psychometric approach would ask which kind of intellectual ability focuses on different aspects of problem solving for different tasks. Look at the description box below at different psychologists who have spearheaded the psychometric approach. There is Charles Spearman's two-factor theory, Louis Thurstone's theory of primary mental abilities, Raymond Cattell's fluid and crystallized intelligence, J.P. Guilford's interdependence of intellectual factors that consist of 150 factors. His concept is that intelligence is much more complex and diverse than both Spearman and Thurston initially asserted. So again, check the description box below for links to the, these men's theories. The psychometric approach presents two issues that challenge the foundation of this paradigm. The first, if we use the psychometric to measure ability, how are we then going to score it? The measurement of intelligence is a product of the 20th century, although interest in the measurement of intelligence does feature in the 19th century. This has led to the creation of the IQ test, which will be discussed in videos to come. The second issue with the psychometric approach is that this approach does not take into account cultural differences. The reason why culture plays an important part is because in different environmental and geographic locations, people need different abilities to adapt successfully and adequately to daily challenges. The issues surrounding the psychometric approach align to issues of construct validity. Construct validity simply is how legitimately or accurately tests generate results that are consistent with what is believed regarding the concept or construct that psychologists are attempting to measure. Validity is an aspect of psychological testing which ensures integrity in results. This and psychological testing will be explained in future videos. The Piagetian approach. The Piaget perspective was developed by Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget, whose lifespan was from 1896 to 1980. 
Piaget's theories belong to the developmental psychology aspect of psychology, as he pioneered identifying different stages in human early development, also discussed in future videos. He asserted that thinking finds its basis on distinct separate mental operations and as infants grow to children, that capacity for mental operations increasingly becomes complex. From age 7, children's thinking is based on a concept referred to as concrete operations or the concrete operational stage. The concrete operational stage lasts until um, from 7 years until 11 years. Concrete operations is defined as the ability to think in a logical and organized set of systematic operations. That children begin to realize that other people around them have thoughts of their own and that these people have their own feelings and intentions. During this stage, there is a concept called reversibility. Reversibility is the capacity of young minds to think and conceive in more than one direction. In this stage, there is also a concept called decentration. Here, the ability to focus on more than one aspect of, a, of an object is developed. This stage entails that children begin to comprehend the relevance of categories and assimilating objects based on size, quantity, and color, and properties that share common features. There's a side note, the necessity of developing the skill is in enabling children to prioritize what is necessary for survival. Therefore, hierarchy is developed based and ordered on necessity. This stage is based on logical thinking, but only on real, tangible, and apparent objects. Abstract concepts like love and freedom has yet to develop. Accordingly, young minds at this age can only reason about that which is, and not that which is possible. During adolescence, there is the formal operation stage. And this is the name for thinking that develops at this age. Formal operations is defined by the capacity of young adults to formulate and test hypothesis according to rules of logic. Formal operational thinking sets thinking in terms of propositions in order to problem solve. Propositions are an abstract quality that determines the accuracy in assessing the nature of things. Propositions assist in understanding the value of meaning behind apparent things. Then there is the information processing approach. This approach borrows from computer processing. The challenge for psychologists is to determine how incoming information is received by the system, how this, the inf this information is compared with information already in the system, that is memory, how additional information is gathered, how all this information is worked on to reach a desired goal. This requires the development of process models. These require the step-by-step -step course of action required to connect thoughts. Process models illustrate the way a considerable extent of information is sectioned into conceivable and more manageable parts or portions. This entails that every new detail need not be actively registered. Useful information is held in storage and interpreted in individual ways and is utilized and utilizes different strategies to problem solve. All right, then there is the situated cognition approach. This approach takes into account the social context that influences thinking. One of the contributors to the social situated cognition approach was Lev Vygotsky who died at the age of 37 in 1934. The assertion of this approach is that humankinds are cultural beings. This understands thinking as a social practice. Knowledge is the arrival of the interaction between people, the environment, and the thoughts expressed. Knowledge is fluid and malleable to new progressive influences. A demonstration of the development of knowledge in the situated cognition approach is tracking the trajectory of language in any given culture. 
Language is a significant example as it exists independently of an individual. Language is then learned through interaction and is governed by necessity. Over time, language becomes in internalized. Ideas, goals, and ways of thinking are the result of our learned interaction with others. Social cognition psychologists investigate thinking against individuals' backgrounds and uncover thinking that structures their daily situations and preoccupations. Okay, the elementary components of thought. At any given point in time, we have to comprehend a constant and overwhelming amount of information. Consider the question or riddle, what can talk only when spoken to? The answer is an echo. To understand the question, a person needs to draw on their own personal, extensive bank of stored memory. Consider the vast depth of information that needs to be filtered in order to focus on the seven words and 28 letters and characters. How is this possible? How are we so able? Cognitive psychologists spend their entire careers attempting to uncover the mysteries, the mechanisms and the means by which humans conceive information and in turn represent knowledge in their mind's eye. Mental representation is defined as a hypothetical, internal, cognitive symbol that represents external reality or a mental process that makes use of such a symbol. Therefore, an integral feature of mental processes is the ability to organize events, situations and experiences and the ability of the mind to represent knowledge which then informs and directs us. The most important aspect of representation that will be, will be explored in future videos is 1. Categories and concepts 2. Imagery 3. Scripts and schemas and 4. Cognitive maps and that will be in my next video in Cognitive Psychology. For now though, from the Garage Grackle, thank you very very much for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you did. Goodbye everyone.